Hello everyone and welcome to this session in which we will review the role of tax preparers, the responsibilities and the potential penalties for violating tax laws. This is an important topic whether you are studying for your CPA exam or the enrolled agent exam. Let's start real quick. Who is a tax preparer? A tax preparer is anyone who prepares tax return for compensation. You prepare the taxes and you get paid for it. You become what's called a tax preparer. While tax preparers don't need formal licenses like CPAs, they must have something called a PTIN, Preparer Tax Identification Number for short P10. It's also crucial to distinguish between tax preparers and tax practitioners. Tax practitioners are like CPAs and enrolled agents who can represent clients before the IRS. It's also important to distinguish between two types of tax preparers, signing preparers and non-signing preparers. And we will discuss those a little bit more in details. Everything I'm mentioning here, we'll discuss it a little bit more in details during the lecture. Now, bear in mind, tax preparers must exercise due diligence. What does that mean? It means they want to make sure they are accurate in their tax claims. They don't have to audit the clients, but they cannot ignore obvious issues like incomplete or inaccurate information when they should have known something is obviously incorrect. Now, violation of due diligence can result in fines depending on the severity of the issue. It could go from a simple mistake, it could range from a simple mistake up to a fraud. But your job is not to audit, but you have to do what's called due diligence, and we'll discuss a little bit more in details. Also, significant penalties will apply for filing incorrect claims or taking an unreasonable position or failing to disclose reportable transaction. Also, preparers must maintain client confidentiality and meet certain procedural standards, such as providing copies of returns and signing the form. So they, there's there is some sort of a standard that they have to maintain between them and the clients. And any breaches can lead to hefty fines or even imprisonment in severe violation. So this is what we will discuss in this session. We'll expand on every topic that I mentioned in the introduction. Let's go ahead and get started in discussing this important topic. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. So who is this group, tax return preparer? Well, simply put, any person who prepare taxes for compensation. Now, any person that prepare taxes for compensation, we're going to have some clarification about this in a moment. We're going to determine who is not considered or who also employs one or more person to prepare for compensation. You either do it yourself or you hire someone and you pay that someone okay, to prepare all or a substantial portion of any return of tax or claim of refund under the Internal Revenue Code. Tax return preparer are different than tax practitioners. Tax practitioners required a license like a CPA, EA, attorney. And we talked about tax, pr tax practitioner when we spoke about Circular 230 in another recording. Remember, tax practitioners, they have unlimited representation right before the IRS, so they can represent you in front of anyone in the, at the IRS. Tax preparer, they, are, they, have, they, are, they have a PIN number. That's how they are known by, as their tax preparer, and they have limited representation before the IRS. So anyone can be a tax preparer. Simply put, you will file uh, paperwork with the IRS, you will obtain a, P, a PTIN, and you will start to prepare return. you don't have you, to, returns. You don't have to be an attorney, an EA, pass any exam or anything like that. Now we're going to separate the tax preparer into signing preparer and non-signing. Starting with signing, 
The signing preparer is the primary person responsible for the overall accuracy of the return or claim of refund. Simply put, they sign their name on the return and because they sign their name, they are responsible for this return. Now, oftentimes, especially in a, for large return or for you know, high net worth clients, you might have or businesses that work. If, 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 if an individual has businesses in several states, you might have multiple parties engaged. The person that signs the return is the primary person. That person is responsible. Okay, you can have a multi-state situation, international tax return. The person that put their name on the return, the preparer's name, preparer's signature. This is it. This is the signing preparer. The non-signing preparer, obviously, they have no primary responsibility of the overall return or the claim of refund because the primary person does. They assist. They're not just mechanical or clerical or intern. Non-signing preparer, they did some substantial work, but they are not primarily responsible. Include will, in, uh, example would include preparers who provide advice that constitute a substantial portion of the return. You, did, you are not, so simply put, you are not clerical. You're not just kind of shuffling paperwork. You're not just collecting information. You are doing some work, but you're still not the primary responsible for the return. For example, an attorney provide work paper for total revenue. The attorney for this client add up all the revenue and gave it to you as an Excel sheet. Okay, let's look at the persons who are not tax preparer. They are not considered tax preparer. Well, if you are an employee at a company and that's what you do, you prepare your 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 employer's tax return, you are not considered a tax preparer. If you have a fiduciary duty and you're preparing a trust, the return for a trust, you are not a tax preparer. A person who prepare a refund claim in response to a notice deficiency. Notice not an original claim. And be careful. You, you want to know those those that group that's not considered a tax preparer. A person who provides typing, reproducing, or other mechanical assisting, like clerical work, like you know, usually in, in the question they they put this in the form of an intern. Any person that provide tax planning, like making projection, those are not tax preparer. And you could see a question which of the following is not a tax preparer. So you want to make sure you are aware of that. Okay. How should tax preparer behave? Obviously, they should follow due diligence. Now, what is due diligence? Well, simply put, making factual inquiries to ensure the client's accuracy and truthfulness. And you want to make sure you follow the tax law. Okay. Now, you can rely on the client information in good faith. You are not auditing them. That's fine. But you cannot ignore. You cannot look the other way. If there is any conflicting information, information appear to be incomplete, or inaccurate, you have to make reasonable inquiries if, the, if that's the situation. Okay, so just basically simply ask them, make the appropriate inquiries about the existence of documentation. Okay, ask them if they have any proof for the cash charitable contribution uh, contribution that they are that they are claiming. Just simply ask, and if they say yes, you're going to have to go with that, as long as there's no reason otherwise to believe otherwise. Okay, now also when you discover that a taxpayer made an error or an omission. Uh, from any document filed with the IRS, you must let them know about the error or the omission immediately and let them know about the consequences. And we talked about this in Circular 230. Tax preparer, are, are, they have to follow this due diligence. Okay, what happened in case of violation? Obviously, penalties are imposed. Now, you're going to have different penalties for different violations. Not all violations are the same. And also the supervisors at certain firms will be subject to that penalty as well. Now, we're going to look at certain terms that you need to be familiar with um, in order to understand uh, the responsibility of the tax preparer. For one thing is a substantial authority. What is when we say substantial authority? Substantial authority means what are we relying on to determine whether something is an income to be included as income or something is a deduction so we can deduct it. OK, this is part of your due diligence. You have to make sure you rely on substantial authority. What is considered substantial authority? Well, the primary authorities include provisions of the IR uh, internal revenue code of course any final regulation by the IRS revenue ruling by the US Treasury Department and court cases those are considered primary authorities what's considered not primary authorities internal revenue bulletin administrative pronouncement administrative pronouncement and any press releases those are not primary authoritative uh, authorities now you need to know what is a frivolous submission. So what is a, um, when is a return is considered a frivolous return? Well, when you omit information necessary to determine the tax liability, you are not including everything. 
you saw a substantial uh, incorrect tax or willful understatement of tax liability. You're just understating. You're simply put underreporting your tax liability and you are doing this on purpose. You have a desire to impede the collection of the tax. You're trying to hide this information. Let's take a look at more terms that you need to be familiar with. Reportable and listed transaction. What is a reportable transaction? A reportable transaction is a transaction that's specifically identified by the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury as either a tax avoidance. Avoidance is a legal use to reduce your tax liability. It's nothing illegal or tax evasion. But when, but when a transaction is considered reportable, you need to know what does that mean, a reportable transaction. A listed transaction is a transaction of one of the types of the transaction the U.S. Treasury has determined to be tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is legal. Again, it's legal to reduce your tax liability. So just, but you need to know what they are. Now, what is that? What is this reportable and listed transaction? Simply put, certain transaction, they could be subject to abuse, subject to fraud, subject. That doesn't mean they are. They are susceptible to that. Therefore, what you have to do is you have to disclose them. And there's a form. You don't have to worry about this. And the reason I'm showing you this is to kind of illustrate the concept so you understand what this reportable and listed item, 45472. And specifically, for example, here, this is an example of reportable transaction, monetary transaction between the reporting corp corporation and a foreign related party. So you are dealing between a corp U.S. corporation and a, and a related party that's foreign. What happened here, you could have, you, it, it could be subject to abuse. And that's why when you have these transactions, something like this, all these transactions, sale of stock, sale of tangible property, they are consi considered reportable. You just have to give us more information about them. You have to report them because they could be subject to abuse. That's all what they are. You just need to know. And you're going to see why do we have to know what is reportable and what's listed transaction. More terms and not terms, basically t t terms or standard you need to be familiar with and certain percentages. When we say more likely than not, that means you have more than 50% chance succeeding in court. This is the most stringent. And you're going to see how we're going to be using this. When we use the word substantial authority, it means you have more than 40% chance succeeding, but less than 50 succeeding in court. Reasonable basis with disclosure, if you have reasonable basis and you disclose it. So basically, uh, you are taking a position, but you're disclosing the position. And you have more than 20% chance of your position being upheld. And you're going to see how we're going to be using this. And arguable means you have less than 20% chance of your position being held in court. Now, why do we need to learn about these things? The, the reason why we need to learn about these things, because we need to know, we need to learn about something called unreasonable position. What is considered unreasonable position? Because we're going to be using those standard to determine whether we consider this position is unreasonable or not unreasonable or not so what is unreasonable position it's a position unless it meets one of the following three condition it's considered unreasonable so a position unreasonable unless it meets one of those three conditions well if you have a substantial authority okay disclosure is not an issue whether you disclose the the revenue that you are not reporting or the deduction that you are taking as long as you have substantial authority, it means bet between 40 to 50 percent chance winning, then it's not unreasonable position. If it meets that, you, you are good. OK, as long as it meets a substantial authority standard, OK, then it's not unreasonable. Now, remember here, whether you disclose or not. Now, if you are taking a position, OK, and you disclose it, you disclose, you say, look, I am not including this revenue but because I don't think it's taxable. I'm telling you this up front. Once you disclose it, then it will not be considered unreasonable position as long as you have a 20% of chance succeeding in court, whether it's revenue or you are taking a deduction that's not supposed to be a deduction, but you're not sure. You're taking the position, but you're going to tell the heiress, look, I'm taking this deduction. I'm disclosing it to you. As long as you have more than more than 20% chance succeeding in court, then your position is not considered unreasonable because you don't want to take an unreasonable position. OK, now, if the transaction is a reportable transaction, remember, we talked about listed transaction and reportable transaction, like if it's a tax shelter or listed transaction, because remember, listed transaction is part of reportable transaction under those circumstances. It will be unreasonable as long as you have 
more than 50% chance succeeding, more likely than not, then it's not unreasonable position. So notice when it's a reportable transaction, the standard is higher. You have to really have have a good chance of winning if it's a reportable position. If it's if you disclose it, you just need more than 20% chance. If you have a substantial authority for a position, it will not be considered unreasonable and, and as long as you have 40 to 50% chance. Now you're saying how do we measure these chances? Those are subject, subjective numbers. But but the key is to kind of understand the big picture. Now, there's a penalty for unreasonable position. Now, when you take an unreasonable position, you could take it for uh, with two things in mind. You could have fraud or you could be just negligent. Okay, what's negligent? It means it, you did not do it intentionally. Just basically you failed. It's an error. The penalty is $1,000 or 50% of the income you derived from that transaction. And negligence would include any failure to make reasonable attempt to either comply with the provisions of the law of the IR, um, internal revenue laws or exercise ordinary and reasonable care in preparation of the return. So that's that's the penalty. For fraud, fraud is different. Fraud is intentional. It's purposeful. It's misleading. It's willful. It's reckless. If you are taking an unreasonable position, and you are committing fraud, the penalty obviously is higher. There are, there are penalties for endorsing a check. The penalty is $635. What's, it, what's endorsing a check? Basically, when the tax the, the taxpayer receives their check from the IRS, the refund. Well, if they want to give it to someone else, if they want to deposit this check, if they want to sell this check, if they want to negotiate this check, they will endorse it. Endorse it means sign it on the back you know, sign for deposit only, sign to, you know, to another person. The the tax preparer cannot negotiate, cannot endorse that check. They cannot endorse it or otherwise negotiate any check issued to a taxpayer. So simply put, that check is the taxpayer, not the preparer. Also, any tax return preparer who operates a check cage, check cash and agency, basically a store, an agency that cashes, endorses, or negotiates tax refund checks for returns prepared, also subject to a penalty. Also, if you say, well, it's not me, it's the agency. Well, if that's your agency, it's you. Also, there's a penalty for aiding or abetting. And here, the proof is on the IRS. And this penalty is basically, you don't have, it doesn't only apply to tax preparer. So it's a $1,000 penalty per return or document is imposed against a person who aid, notice you don't have to be the tax preparer, who aid in the preparation of the return or the document they have or have reason to believe would result in an understatement of the tax liability of another person. Simply put, someone's given you, in quote, a tip to reduce your taxes, and that tip is not really legitimate tip, and they know it's not legitimate tip. So this penalty applies to people other than the tax preparer. It could be somebody, an advisor, an attorney, a friend, a corporate officer, executives, anyone. Now, if you are involved in this from a clerical assistance perspective, you're just putting the, the return together, then you don't have to worry about the penalty. You, you don't incur the penalty because you're not really making the decision. You participated in the return, but usually that's a secretary's job in a CPA firm. Okay. Series of penalties for unethical behavior and those penalties, I'm going to call them the $60 penalties, but they could be 75, 80, 95. They change from year to year or every several, every several years. This used to be $50 and before that was below. Let's go through them. First is failure to provide a copy to taxpayer unless a reasonable cause exists. How much is the penalty? $60. So you have to provide a copy to the taxpay taxpayer. What does that mean? It means if they ask you for a copy of their paperwork, you have to provide it, provide it to them. The penalty is $60. Failure to sign a return. If you did not sign a return, the penalty is $60. Maximum is $31,500. Always these are subject to change. Failure to furnish your identification number. Well, $60 and the max of $31,500. Failure to properly retain records. You have to retain records for three years. Copy of the return or the listing clients. The penalty is $60 or 31500 per year. Also, there, there's a failure to file a correct information return. For example, the employer, for example, take an H&R block by July 31st has to be submitted to the IRS, name or tax preparer, tax identification number, and place of work. They must sign. I told you they must sign the return. 
after the completion of the return, but before it's presented to the taxpayer. So you have to sign it and give a copy to the taxpayer to them, look, this is your return. I already signed it. Now it's your turn. Also, remember, we talked about retaining record. You have to retain the record for three years. Otherwise, there's a penalty. I mentioned this already twice, three years. Or you can keep a list or remember, or you can keep a list that include the return uh, that include for the returns and claim prepared the following information. So you need to keep the following information if you don't keep the return. The taxpayer's name, taxpayer identification number, their tax years, the type of return or claim prepared. Okay. Now when we said of the return period, what do we mean by the period? When does the period start? The return period is 12 month period beginning July 1st each year. So whenever you did the return, the July 1st, you count three years from July 1st. This is the period. Okay, I don't think you have to worry much about this. This is maybe an EA enrolled agent exam question, but yeah, now you're aware of it. Other procedural requirement. Um, again, we did the slide. Let's move on. I guess I have a copy of this. Disclosure of the taxpayer information. There's a penalty if you disclose information. Look, you owe you owe them a the duty of confidentiality. They're giving you their information, their social security, their W-2s, their business return, their banking information. So you wanna make sure you this is confidential, okay? So if you disclose the information or uses the information without the taxpayer consent, so you cannot disclose it or use it without their consent, okay? The penalty is not imposed, obviously, if the disclosure was specifically for preparing assisting in preparing or providing services in connection with the preparation of the tax return. There are some exceptions. You're going to see, see them on the next slide. Okay. But let's assume you, you needed to give this return. You prepared their business return and you need, uh, they have uh, a partnership and you need to give K1 to another person. Well, you are given this information to help the other person because they cannot prepare their 1040 without the K1. That's different. Okay. The penalty is $250 per disclosure, max of 10,000. Again, I'm not going to keep repeating this. Those numbers will change. Now, if you, if you disclose on purpose, knowingly or recklessly, well, you are guilty of a misdemeanor and subject to $1,000 in fines and up to one year in prison. As I told you, there, there is an exception for this, and we looked at some exceptions. If you're following court order or the IRS revenue code, they told you to, they told you to uh, give them the information and it's legitimate. If you have the client consent, here the client consent has to be in writing, explicit and specific to disclose. Again, if you want to give the uh, tax return within the same firm, for example, somebody else would like to review the return within the same firm, for the purpose of quality or peer review to the extent necessary to accomplish the review. Simply put, CPA firms, what they do, um, you have your business, you know, CPA firm, and we have CP a CPA firm A, uh, they will hire CPA firm B to check their paperwork. And, you know, why? It's quality control. They want to make sure they want to bring new sets of eyes, an external party. It's part of their quality control. That's okay as long as it's for that limited purpose. Again, for the use in assisting or preparing, providing services in connection of a tax preparation, as I said, it's K1, or you're providing the return for another individual or another party to prepare their state or local return, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Those are exceptions, and I spoke about this exception earlier.